Good morning, and welcome to Community United Church of Christ, where we are growing spiritually, sharing God's love, and serving others. This service today is designed for the fifth Sunday in Lent, uh, which is March 21st, 2021, but whenever and wherever it is that you are able to join us today, welcome. May the space that you occupy, just as the space that I occupy, be filled by the same exact holy and wonderful Spirit of God. Before we get started today, I have <clears throat> one announcement to share with you, um, but it's a big one. We are going to be returning to in-person worship on Easter Sunday, and then every Sunday after that. So that means that... Um, next week will be the last week that I'll be pre-recording services. Every service after that will be Sunday morning live. We'll be live streaming the services during the services, and they'll also be available online on YouTube forever and ever afterwards. Um, so if you're unable to be here with us on those mornings, you can still worship along with us at whatever time you are able and comfortable. Um, so we, you should have received at least one email this week and a, an automated phone call with uh, my beautiful voice in it telling you good morning at five o'clock in the evening. You know, fun times. Um, letting you know that pre-registration is required for Easter Sunday because it's Easter and we wanna make sure we're not totally overcrowding the place. The 1015 filled up in about two days the 815 still has like 30 some slots left and I put up a 1215 service as an overflow if the 815 fills up. I would ask you to try to sign up for the 815 if you can instead of the 1215. Um, we're, if people want to show up, like we're gonna have Easter. It's been a year and it's Easter, um, but I've been asked <laughs> by those who would be uh, helping to put the service together and um, and to do all of the cleaning and the setup and the singing and the music and the, all of the things that happen that if we could keep it to two full services instead of one full and two partial, then that would be preferable. So make sure you check out the website, communityucc.net slash Easter or you call the office and talk with Jeff at some point um, to get yourself signed up for that service. <sighs> I am so excited to be with you again and to speak to people and not pews and a camera lens. Um, it has been, <sighs> it has been a year that I don't think any of us will finish processing for a couple of years down the road, um, but, um, I am very excited for resurrection, for new life, new opportunities, and a bright tomorrow. Also, one final note, if any of you are in the 1A vaccination category and you've had a really hard time getting a vaccine and you would like to, please reach out to me. Um, I've recently come into some partnerships that um, I've been working with to help people get vaccinated who have had a hard time going through the systems and everything with the wait lists and the individual places and all of that. Um, so please reach out to me this week and I will hopefully be able to get you connected and scheduled as soon as possible. So let us join together in a word of prayer. Holy God, we thank you today for your presence in our world. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for that deep intuitive knowing that you have built into each and every one of us. Your scripture says that you have written eternity into the hearts of humanity, but not the mind to understand it. And so we just pray that you would help us to know you intuitively, intrinsically in our bones, and that this time that we have set aside to worship you and to know you would be a time of, uh, would be an uh, enriching and uplifting time. 
Keep us safe until we can be together again, Lord, and thank you for your faithfulness to us um, throughout all of this time. In your name we pray, amen. Now, as we have done throughout this Lent, I would invite you to grab yourself something percussive, or maybe just your hands or feet. However it is that you're able to affirm the words of this liturgy through the, the beating of your heart. We come to worship, to pray and learn. We come looking for Jesus in scripture lessons, in our own life experiences, in helping our world and in prayers for each other. We seek to follow in the way of Jesus. We lay bare before God and one another our own wilderness journeys, filled with some gladness and hope, with reluctance and sorrow, with fear and confusion. O oh God, speak to us, show us, touch us with your presence. Let our Lenten journey lead us to Jesus so that we may show Jesus forth in our lives, in our faith community, and our world. Amen. Would you join me today in singing our first hymn? Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. This is one of those stories that is told in three of the four Gospels, but each time it's told, it's told a little bit differently, you know, like every story that anyone has ever told. Um, and it's also, we're going to be reading it from the Message translation, which is a very poetically inspired uh, vernacular translation that aims to be readable and to uh, hold true to the spirit more than to the letter of the words. Um, so pardon me if this doesn't sound very bible -y, but this is one of those times that I think the message really nails what uh, the author is trying to get at right here. Back in the boat, Jesus and the disciples recrossed the sea to Jesus' hometown. 
They were hardly out of the boat when some men carried a paraplegic on a stretcher and set him down in front of Jesus. Jesus, impressed by their bold belief, said to the paraplegic, Cheer up, son! I forgive your sins. Now, some of the religious scholars whispered, Oh, why, that's blasphemy. Jesus knew what they were thinking and said, Why this gossipy whispering? Which do you think is simpler? To say, I forgive your sins, or get up and walk? Well, just so it's clear that I'm the Son of Man and authorized to do either, or both. And as at this he turned to the paraplegic and said, Get up! Take your bed and go home! And the man did it. And the crowd was awestruck, amazed, and pleased that God had authorized Jesus to work among them in this way. Now, passing along, Jesus saw a man at work collecting taxes. His name was Matthew. Jesus said, come along with me. And Matthew immediately stood up and followed him. Later, when Jesus was eating supper at Matthew's house with his close followers, a lot of disreputable characters came and joined them. When the Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company, they had a fit and lit into Jesus' followers, saying, what kind of example is this from your teacher, acting all cozy with crooks and misfits? Jesus, overhearing them, shot back. Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Hey, go find out what this scripture means. I am after mercy, not religion. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. <laughs> here ends this reading. May God add his blessing to the hearing of it. <sighs> you know, I've always hated going to the dentist. <laughs> Great non sequitur. It's nothing personal. I know many of you work for uh, dentists. Some of you may be dentists. I love you. I think you're great. However, I hate going to see you. And it's not because of the pain or because of the fear of drills or needles or any of that stuff. I'm fine with that. What it is is the fear of judgment. <laughs> the knowledge that I haven't done what I was supposed to do since the last time I saw you. You know, floss twice a day and make sure that I'm brushing for three minutes and then mouthwash and all of that good stuff. I, I Sometimes, you know, I do it a little bit, but I know that I'm not great at it and I've always had bad teeth anyway. And so I, at all costs, will not go to the dentist for my regular checkups and cleanings until one of my teeth literally just explodes and then I have to go get oral surgery. All of that, just because I'm afraid of those little condescending I told you so's or you really haven't been flossing, have you? One time uh, uh, somebody said to me, um, here, I'll make you a deal. Figure out the teeth you want to keep and then just floss those. And I was like, well, man, I'm never coming back here again. I already feel awful about myself. <laughs> but I want to let you off the hook a little bit because Pastors get a very similar kind of response from people. You know, pre-pandemic, when I would run into someone in the grocery store, you know the number one thing that I would hear, the first thing that somebody would say to me after they said, oh, hey, Pastor Zach, it would always be some kind of apology for not making it out to church more regularly. Like, oh, hey, Pastor Zach, how's it going? Yeah, I really wish I could have been there at church um, it's just been, you know, it's just been crazy. It's just been busy. It's just been crazy. Like, like I'm walking around giant with my church attendance scorecard looking, oh, well, there's, there's Mr. Jones over there. And well, he's been six weeks tardy. I need to go collect the tithes from him in the frozen food aisle. Like, no, I'm not doing that. Of course not. I'm just happy to see you. You know, now during this lockdown time when nobody's been in the church building. You know what people say when they see me now? It's, 
Hey, hi, Pastor Zach, how's it going? I'm just kidding. They say, hey, Pastor Zach, how's it going? Hey, I've really appreciated these worship videos that you've been doing. They're great. I mean, I haven't watched all of them, and but I really try to. I, I try. <laughs> like, you're fine. You're fine. I love you. It's okay. Maybe at some point in your life, you experienced... A, a, you had an experience in church where you uh, got some kind of <clears throat> judgmental side eye from someone in the pews or maybe from the pulpit even. Some pastor made you feel really guilty for not being good enough to grace these pews. I don't know what it is that has made so many people feel so judged by Christians especially when this is the church of Jesus Christ. And it's in our creed that this is, we are, Christ is the one head of our church. Christians, the word even means little Christs. So why are people so afraid of being judged by us when Jesus himself gave us such a different example? Example, our story today, our wonderful little colloquial story. It's a story in three parts. Part one is the paraplegic story. Now, in the other gospels, you've probably heard this one as it was so crowded in Jesus's house, there was no way to get in, so they climbed up on the roof, they cut a hole in the ceiling, and they lowered him down on ropes, and Jesus looked up and laughed and said, <laughs> my goodness, because of the faith of your friends, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> In this story, he gets off a boat and they rush to the shore like they've been waiting all day for him at the shore, just waiting for him to maybe come back. And they place him at Jesus's feet, presumably to heal him. And they don't say a thing in the story. They don't ask him for anything, but Jesus intuitively looks at them and he sees faith in their eyes and he forgives this man's sins. No one ever preaches that, by the way, in terms of how one becomes saved. Um, no one ever says you can have your sins forgiven because of the faith of someone else. That's maybe worth looking into on another sermon. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't care in that moment. He doesn't care if that paraplegic man actually is repentant or actually has come to ask for forgiveness. Jesus is just giving out mercy and grace and forgiveness like it's Halloween candy, like it's a... Like it's a uh, a door prize or like a bulletin or like somebody handing out flyers on the streets. He's just so eager to the first thing that he says to a person is your sins are forgiven. Congratulations. <laughs> no hesitancy, no question, no penance required. You show up, you're forgiven. You're good. You're in. You're one of us. I love you. I see you. I know you. You're good. Let's move on. I mean, Jesus takes care of this guy's physical needs too, but not before he makes sure this guy knows how much he loves him and how much he has already forgiven anything he could possibly do wrong. And then in part two, Jesus moves on to Matthew, the tax collector. And Jesus sees Matthew, this greedy, lying, imperial, Roman-loving son of an Alpheus. <laughs> and he marches right up to that swindling sinner, and he says, hey, guy, I think you're pretty great. We could use a guy like you. <laughs> then Matthew goes on to become one of Jesus's core apostles. He goes and spreads the gospel all over the place, witnesses firsthand the works of Jesus, and then writes this very gospel that we're reading today. His brokenness as a man was not a hindrance to God. In fact, if anything, it was why Jesus called him in the first place. And then later, in part three of our story, Jesus goes to his house and of course, a person like Matthew, who is already a kind of unseemly gentleman, would have unseemly kinds of friends. 
So Jesus is at this party. He's partying. They're carrying on. He, as usual, is being accused of being a drunkard himself and of partying a bit too hard. And the religious leaders of the day are standing outside, looking in on this raucous gathering and saying to his disciples on the outside, what is wrong with this man? How does this guy claim to be some kind of moral authority when this is his public witness? And Jesus overhearing, because Jesus apparently, in this story at least, has the hearing ability of a mother of toddlers. And it's just, excuse me, what? What did you say? He's got eyes and ears on the back of his head and everywhere else. He says to them, who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick? And then love the snark in this. To say this to the teachers of scripture. (laughs) Hey, go figure out what this scripture means. I'm after mercy, not religion. Ah, I think that's, that's Amos. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle the insiders. Mm. And this is one of Jesus' best jokes. This is a running gag throughout all of his, his life. Is He'll say things like, oh, well, you know, it's the sick that need the healer, not the well. Or he'll say, oh, well, I went and chased the lost sheep, not the ones that are fine. And the insinuation here is that the the people in this party are all sick and they need Dr. Jesus to make them better. And the Pharisees, they're well and healthy and they're fine and they don't need Dr. Jesus. But the big joke is the Pharisees need Dr. Jesus more than the people in the party because the people in the party know that they're broken. They know that they're flawed. They know that they're tragically broken. The Pharisees... And the religious folk, the good, the good religious, God-fearing people think they've got it all together, and so they don't recognize how sick they really are. And Dr. Jesus can't do anything for them because they refuse to admit that they need him in the first place. And Jesus, meanwhile, is still just raining down mercy like New Year's Eve confetti. While the Pharisees are offering forgiveness only to those who follow the rules of their religion. See, for the Pharisees, acceptance comes after repentance. Acceptance comes after repentance. You ought to be made clean and good first, and then you're welcome. But for Jesus, acceptance leads to repentance. Acceptance leads to repentance. This is why the broken people of Judea flocked to Jesus in droves, not because he gave them an easy out that said, hey, you're okay, I'm okay, we're okay, no one has to change, everything is great. No, he gave them unconditional love and acceptance where they were, and that gives a person a foundation on which to build on which to actually become a better person. And this is still the church. This church follows that same Jesus Christ. And we today are still trying, sometimes succeeding, to follow in that example. So I want you, O person at home, to know personally that you are loved unconditionally You are known intimately, and though you are flawed tragically, you are forgiven endlessly. And to that end, I want to teach you a song today. Um, I almost took this song out of our secular hymn series because I don't think any of you know it. It's one of the last songs on a somewhat obscure album by this uh, husband and wife singer-songwriting duo from Ohio named Over the Rhine. Um, The song is called All of My Favorite People. And 
Though it's not as well known as those, the other songs we've been singing, it's certainly no Beatles track. I think the message of it is just as beautiful and just as important. Actually, it was, I was going to cut this out and it was Bridget who said, no, that was my favorite one of the ones you sent over here. You can't cut that one, cut a different one. <laughs> And so um, she encouraged me that it's good enough that I should teach it to you. Um, so the song, like I said, is called All of My Favorite People. It's by uh, Over the Rhine. Husband, wife, singer, songwriter, folk duo. They're really sweet music. Great for listening to this time of year. And Linford Detweiler, the one of the husband of the husband-wife duo, tells the story about how this particular song was born um, difficultly. <laughs> At one point, about five or six years before they wrote it, um, one of them had just said, you know, all of my favorite people are broken. And the other one said, oh, that's good. We should remember that. And, the, and so then it got stored away in some notebook somewhere, some back of their mind somewhere, and it just was left to marinate, to figure out what it wanted to be. And every time they brought this phrase back up and they tried to flesh it out and put words to it and melody to it, just nothing really felt right. Like, this song wanted to be something, ah, but it was just so hard to extract what it wanted to be like a giant block of marble that would one day be a very small statue. That there was something in there, but deep within. And I'm talking years, years of writing verses that would just get thrown away. At one point, I think three or four years into this process, they even invited one of their songwriting friends to come on board and try to help them with this. And they spent days together and they took the song in three or four different directions, and every single time, at the end of it, it just felt wrong. And eventually, both their friend Mary and his wife said to him, you know what, Linford, I think you're going to have to do this yourself. Because this song apparently is yours, and it means something to you, and none of us can crack it. So a couple of years after that, at this point, we're like five years into the process. He recalled this story and he said, my father was a Protestant minister for part of his life in a little coal mining town in Southern Ohio. And I've been haunted since I was a child by something that would take place at Wednesday night prayer meetings. After we sang a few hymns, my father would go to the front of the sanctuary with a little spiral notebook and ask if there were any prayer requests. Folks were free to express their concerns. Say, Edith was back in the hospital with complications from her knee surgery. Andy was afraid that there was going to be layoffs at the coal company where he worked. Mike had a particularly difficult chemistry test coming up. But occasionally, someone would raise their hand and say, I have an unspoken request. An unspoken request? That captured my imagination. What were these prayers too intimate or too intuitive for words? I was working on my song and that dilemma found me once again. All my favorite people are broken. Believe me, my heart should know. Some prayers are better left unspoken. I just want to hold you and let the rest go. So I emailed Mary and ran it past my wife and they both felt like I was on the right track. Then back to writing, additional verses, a process that took a few more years with many false starts and many verses, ultimately ending up on the cutting room floor. Have you ever felt that before? the desire to share an unspoken prayer, something perhaps too intimate, too embarrassing, too awkward or traumatic to admit, to explain in detail, but that someone, something that nonetheless demands expression 
When you don't want to give somebody the details of what you're suffering or ask them for specific solutions to them, but you just want someone to be with you, to hold you, as it were, up in prayer or physically. Of course you have. You're human. I assume you're human anyway. There might be some bots watching this right now. But you're human. You've had this experience because we're all broken. <laughs> but like the broken glass that makes up the stained glass windows of this church, you are also beautiful. <laughs> and I can tell you from personal experiences that when you own your brokenness, when you let your guard down and you let people in, you'll find that everyone else is just as broken as you are. Some of them are more broken than you are. Some of the people who seem to have their lives put together more than anyone else have it the least put together, but they're just really good at pretending. Speaking from personal experience, I mean me, not one of you that I, anyway. <laughs> These people are usually just pretending to have it all together because they think you have it all together and they don't want you, who you know you're, you're pretty broken, right? But they don't want you to know that they are broken because then you would look at them differently and it would be embarrassing for them to know, for you to know them and them to know you. You see what I'm saying. Every time I have spoken publicly here about my struggles, with my own mental health and emotional health. Dozens of you have told me secretly that you also have struggled with this kind of mental illness. And I love you for your bravery. It's not easy to admit that you're a little broken too, but it gets a lot easier when we can all admit it together and also affirm that we are beloved and beautiful in our brokenness. Orphaned believers, skeptical dreamers, step forward. You can stay right here. You don't have to go. Oh, but that's a line from the song that you probably don't know yet. So why don't we just sing it together? The words will be on the screen. Wherever you are, sing along, please. And as we do, my prayer for you is that you would be freed from the shackles of guilt and shame, that those shackles that have been around you that tell you that you have to be perfect first before you can enter the presence of God or the presence of the church, the body of believers, that you have to have your act together before you're worthy instead of the other way around, instead of the Jesus who just says, you're forgiven and you're forgiven, left and right, much to the chagrin of the religious people. May you know that Jesus loves you and accepts you just as you are right now. May you know that every single person in your life is just as tragically flawed as you are. And may this knowledge bring about a spirit of mercy a spirit of patience for yourself and for others. And may this community of faith, beloved, in be one in which our brokenness becomes our bond and our love brings light and life to the world. Let's sing together.
blooming spring. Jesus is fairer. Jesus is purer. He makes our sorrowing spirit sing. Fair is the sunshine, fair is the moonlight, bright the sparkling stars on high. Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines purer than all the angels in the sky. Beautiful Savior, Lord of all nations, Son of God and Son, Let us pray. God, there are many in our world who long to know the love of Christ. In joy and celebration of the many gifts that we share, we ask that you would bless all our offerings and may Jesus shine in all the world. Amen. And now, friends, would you receive this benediction? As God has forgiven our shortcomings and blessed our brokenness, let us go joyfully into God's world, offering God's love, forgiveness, and peace to all we meet. Go in peace, and the peace of God goes with you. Amen. <laughs>